This is the last part of the prelim review. Um, we have gone over everything pretty much I wanted to, with the exception of wave. Uh, there was a lecture we had, lecture nine, talking about surface gravity waves uh, and two limits, deep water and shallow water, and lecture ten was the application of that to ship wakes. In terms of waves, uh, we looked at two, those two classifications, the two sort of limiting classifications. Uh, on the left, um, we had uh, deep water waves. So we have a waveform that looks something like this again. Lambda is the wavelength, the distance between the two crests, and the bottom would be somewhere down here, let's say. If the depth h was greater than lambda over 2, or half the wavelength, then we call these deep water waves in the sense that uh, the depth of the water no longer mattered. If the wave is traveling in this direction, is it inducing a velocity field with closed orbits that are circles in this direction? and these orbits decrease with depth until you reach a point halfway below <coughs> or one half a wavelength below the surface at which the orbits have effectively been reduced to zero amplitude <coughs> and the wave speed of these waves c is given by the square root of g over k, where k is the wave number, which we can write as square root of g lambda over 2 pi. So most importantly, it's proportional to the square root of the wavelength. c is proportional to the square root of the wavelength. So longer waves go faster, and um, that means these waves are dispersive. If we create a series of waves of different wavelengths that are interacting and overlapping, the longer waves will outrun the shorter waves. That is the reason in the case of the homework where we had a storm generated offshore which will generate a whole spectrum of waves, long waves, short waves, tall waves, small waves. The long waves will tend to outrun the short waves. Um, it technically moves as the uh, the wave packets or group group velocity, but we can think of it as long waves outrunning the short waves, and thus those are the ones that reach the beach first from the storm. So they're propagating over hundreds of miles and reaching the beach before the shorter waves. And from the dispersion relationship, we can also derive this from the general relationship for wave velocity, but from dispersion. Uh, your deep water dispersion relationship looks like this. Omega squared equals GK. Uh, based on the relationship between uh, omega and the period T and the relationship between the wave number K and the wavelength lambda, you can drive an expression for the period, wave period in terms of the wavelength. And from that, we see that longer waves are also of longer period. So these longer waves move faster, these longer period move wa waves move faster, and that explains why uh, with the storm offshore producing swell um, for a beach that the swell tends to start with the longer period waves that have arrived first uh, and de decrease with time. In the opposite limit we had uh, a shallow water wave. In that case the wavelength was long compared to the depth. The constraint or the criteria that we used was that um, h was less than uh, the h was less than a point oh, or um, five percent of lambda. So we'll say lambda uh, over twenty. In that case, we have what's known as a shallow water wave. In this limit, the orbits, again, it's propagating in this direction. The orbits are ellipses. 
as we go deeper in the water column, the x component or major axis of the lips stays constant, and we're at the bottom, and it naturally produces a straight line. There's no vertical component to that ellipse due to the bottom boundary condition, which constrains the flow to be parallel to the wave propagation direction. In this case, the wave is very much feeling the bottom and vice versa. The bottom feels the presence of the wave, uh, namely this induced velocity on top will generate a bottom boundary layer uh, and stresses which move back and forth. As the wave passes over, there's a stress to the right, a stress to the left, and um, there's an imbalance that can occur and it can generate on the bottom these little ripples, these wave orbital ripples that you sometimes see when you go stand at the beach. The wave, these waves are non-dispersive, so it's a celerity in this case is given by root gh. This is the shallow water wave celerity. It is proportional to the square root of the depth. It is not a property of the wave. So longer waves and shorter waves travel the same speed. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say about that. Um, so there's criteria that sort of determine what type of wave they are. If you're given the depth and you're given the period, you can use the dispersion relation to come up with the wavelength um, and check your criteria um, to see if it works, whether it's shallow or deep. Of course, in between, there's this sort of gray zone in here, and that's where we have um, intermediate form waves, which for what the expressions are more complicated in the sense that they are dispersive, they depend on the wavelength, and they depend on their depth at the same time. So these are just two limits, and it's not a uh, discrete jump between them. The second part, or the, the next lecture, uh, involved looking at the Kelvin wake of the boats. So we started looking at what Kelvin had developed. This is a deep water wave solution, so he considered deep water waves, and he considered a moving pressure source in the flow. And what he observed is when you stand on a boat and you look out at the wake, from the point of view of the observer on the boat, the wake is fixed in space. And he called that, um, it's, it's stationary, since it translates with the boat. And he kept that assumption for his wave solution to generate what were the uh, surviving waves and the pressure distribution, the ones that essentially didn't outrun the boat or that the boat didn't outrun. And it's a very, very elegant mathematical solution that looks very much like reality even though it's considering a point source and it's inviscid. There's a cone here, given subtended by the angle 19 point, I believe it's 47 degrees. And there's two different waveforms. There's a divergent waveform, looks something like this. And there's a transverse waveform, which are more normal to the direction of the ship, where you can think of the wave crests of the transverse waves that are essentially paralleling the ship motion. The limiting angle of the divergent waves, they're traveling, say, at this direction here. Switch colors here. Relative to the horizontal, this works out to 35 degrees. And uh, I think that's all I wanted to say about that. So this is from a moving pressure source. You have two angles to think about. The cone separating the Calvin wave or the divergent waves, and you can see that clearly in the images I put up, including the satellite image, and these transverse waves here. Actually, I've drawn them the opposite of the way they should look. And the wavelength of these transverse waves, the distance between these, is established by the ship speed. And we have the wavelength is equal to 2 pi v squared over g. And this comes from the assumption we look at the deep water wave, uh, the deep water wave formula, for which we have c equals the square root of 2 pi, I'm sorry, um, square root of g lambda over 2 pi from the previous 
page we were looking at. That's a deep water wave celerity. And then we assume C equals U, or V, for the ship speed. That is, these are for the transverse waves, which are moving essentially, the crests are moving the same direction as the ship. So C equals V. If the wave celerity did not match the ship speed, then the ship would outrun them, or they would outrun the ship. So they wouldn't be stationary relative to the ship. So the only waves that are stationary are matching speed. So we have C equals root G lambda over 2 pi, but we can replace this C with the ship speed, and we have, um, and we could solve this for V, and we'll end up with this relation right here. That that wavelength is established like this. So we had a homework question associated with that. Let's say we use satellites to sense a given distance, lambda, between the transverse wave crests. Can you solve for the ship speed? And yes, you can, V squared. In this case, the transverse waves are, are more effective in the sense that it's easy to calculate the um, the ship speed from them because it's directly correlated with their wavelength in space, and that is uh, what some people have attended, uh, attempted to do. There's a lot of development in synthetic aperture radar in order to essentially see through the clouds, sense these wakes through the clouds at typical wavelengths, um, you know, 60, 50 meters that these uh, other military ships were traveling at. So that's the Kelvin solution again it's based on a point distribution here so it's not really a ship it's just a, a single point infinitesimal point in space but the resulting wave train mimics very much that of uh, ships that I put in the four images in lecture 10 uh, you'll see both the divergent and transverse wave fields you'll see the cone uh, that contains a divergent wave field and it, particularly in that sailboat picture, you can see the transverse waves clearly. And again, their wavelength is established entirely by the ship speed, assuming the ship is operating in deep water, which is the assumption we will go with uh, for the class. We also spent some time looking at how uh, the wave field influences the drag. And I'll just sketch quickly an idea of what the wave drag tends to look like. It has these sort of fast oscillations and then slow oscillations and then skyrockets. And uh, this is a wave drag, wave resistance, whereas the friction drag tends to be more smoothly varying in space. And it essentially is running something close to V squared. It's, it's under V squared, but it's somewhat proportional V squared. Whereas the wave drag has these oscillations and then uh, gets very large. And we focused on <clears throat> what was causing these humps and hollows. So there's these humps and hollows. There's a local maxima and there's local minima. There's a local maxima and local minima. And then it rises up to local maxima. And there's a theoretical maxima and actually a theoretical decrease again. But in reality, what starts to happen is the boats approach the speed. They are, if they are displacement vessels, they aren't able to go faster than the speed and if they are non and if they were to theoretically have enough horsepower what happens is the stern wave is collapsing and the boat starts to squat in the water and it's trying to climb over its bow wave which is essentially impossible um, so to get through this kind of wall think of it like a wall your only options are to uh, get out of displacement mode which is to move to a semi-planing or a planing mode, and we'll focus on that in the high-speed lectures, or use hydrofoils to lift the hull um, to reduce the displacement, and we'll also talk about that in the high-speed lectures. So most displacement hull forms are stuck in this range here, um, where we labeled this wall roughly as fruit equals 0.4. That's a very rough approximation, and some people like to use the speed-to-length ratio, V over L, 1.34. This depends on the hull form and the propulsion and everything else, but it's just the back of the envelope calculation. Um, and, and we saw something similar. When we looked at a realistic hull form um, using the method discussed in the book, where you view the bow and stern wave uh, points of formation as not being exactly at the bow and the stern, I think we computed a fruit number um, here of something like roughly 0.375, something like that, so right before the drag rise. 
So 0.4 is not a bad number to use an approximation of where the drag um, starts to rise quite quickly. So the displacement vessels are stuck in here, and this would include cargo ships and um, sailboats, most yachts, uh, yacht forms, things like that are stuck in here. The other thing we just spoke about was actually looking at how these, where these fruit numbers come from, or more specifically where these humps and hulls come from, using a very simple model. In reality, this is in fact affected by the divergent wave field. It's affected by the transverse wave field, and and we can think of both those wave fields as being generated by the ship, a ship which has, you know, infinitesimal number of pressure points along the hull, rather than Kelvin's single point. Um, a ship in reality has you know an infinite number of points that are generating these waves, and it, we look and the, and so if you compute it directly, that's the way you have to deal with it uh, through the form of an integral or using CFD methods, um, and ultimately it's a complex phenomena, and that is the reason why um, in tank testing we choose to measure effectively measure the waves by taking the total resistance and dividing it into frictional and wave components. We estimate the friction, we measure the total, and if by subtracting friction from total, we are, we are getting a number for the wave drag. So we are effectively measuring in the tank the wave drag, um, rather than trying to estimate it as in friction. So friction is easier to deal with, um, wave drag is more difficult to estimate, and that's why we, we do that in the tank. We looked at a very simple model. Well, I'll show you a very simple model, perhaps even simpler than the one presented in your book. This idea that you have a boat and it's producing a bow wave somewhere at the stern, a positive bow wave at the stern, and a trough, I'm sorry, the bow, bow positive bow wave at the bow and a trough at the stern. And then the question is, uh, how are these two wave trains going to interact? And that interaction is going to depend, and actually, no, let me erase this and move the boat up the screen a little bit. This interaction is going to depend on uh, the wavelength of the bow wave. And that wavelength of the bow wave depends on the ship speed or more, um, it depends on the ship speed and the ratio of the wavelength to the bow wave depends on the fruit, on the fruit number. So we have that wavelength, the transverse, transverse wavelength, lambda equals 2 pi, times the ship speed divided by g. If we divide both sides by the length of the boat, lambda over L equals 2 pi v squared over LG, and recognize the fact that this last quantity here is the fruit number squared. We have this is equal to 2 pi fruit number squared. So this ratio, which is non-dimensional, is correlated with this ratio, and this is ultimately why um, fruit number is how we decide wave drag. Because you see here, the wave drag is going to be established by this ratio, and that's dependent on the fruit number. As long as we test at the same fruit number, we are presenting, we are running the boat. Essentially, th this same ratio is holds true for the model as it does to the full scale, and we're generating self-similar wave patterns, and thus the same wave drag coefficient. Remember the wave drag itself, which we talked about before, when we scale that from model to full scale, it goes as the ratio of the displacements of the boat, or the cube of the ratio of the link scales, or the model scale. In this case, uh, so wave drag is the same, it's same fruit number, so fruit number model equals fruit number ship, that's the way it's done in the tanks, that's the same as uh, what Fruit called corresponding speeds, or his speed to length ratios, were, were set equivalently between the model and the full scale ship. That's what's necessary if you have a full scale ship and a full scale ship length and velocity, design velocity. You can use that to calculate the model velocity to run at the same fruit number of corresponding speed, which will give you the same wave drag coefficient. CW model equals CW ship. And again, the wave resistance of the full scale ship is going to, I'm going to run a space here, is going to be the same as the wave resistance of the model scaled up by the ratio of the displacements, 
or cube of the ratio of the link scales. Um, so let me, I think I have enough room here, let's draw a very simple looking boat. Again, it's, it's creating, it's got some length, L, whatever that is. And let's say for the most simple possible model, we're generating a bow wave here, a positive bow wave here, and a negative or sink stern wave here. And the first condition, let's say we are running such that lambda over L, this ratio up here, is 1. And that means we have exactly one wavelength extending from the bow to the stern. And I'll try to draw that as best I can. Here's a wave. We're back to a positive crest exactly here. Back to a negative crest exactly here. Positive crest. And if I extend the stern wave, which is also at the same wavelength because it is a transverse wave and the wavelength is set by the ship speed, we find out we have this kind of uh, oscillation like this. And if we sum these two waves together, in this theoretical funny case, we get no waves here, although it's a bit poorly drawn. So essentially the wake is extinguished in this case when we have lambda over L equal 1. In our simple model where our bow wave is a positive wave at the bow and our stern wave is a negative wave at the stern. And again, the book considers a more complex case where the bow wave can be created somewhat after the bow, which is more realistic, and the stern wave isn't necessarily at the stern. And this depends on the bluffness of the ship. So they included, they used a link scale, which was a link between the pressure sources, LPS, and depended on K, a kind of form coefficient for the ship. Here, we're essentially assuming LPS equals, equals the length of the ship, or therefore K, their K, or the book's K, equals 1. Uh, so this situation right here where lambda over L, if we solve this, we will get fruit equals 0.4. So in our theoretical model, the last hollow, this is the last hollow, so let me try to sketch it down here. We have our oscillations in the wave drag. Here's the last hollow before the, the wave, the drag rise. Here's RW and fruit. This last hollow is occurring right here when fruit number equals 0.4, according to our theoretical model. A real ship will have an, a K that is less than 1, this uh, form coefficient. The bow wave will be pushed back a bit, and the stern wave will be pushed forward a bit, which means that we will achieve this situation at a lower speed or lower fruit number for a given ship. You will need a slightly shorter wave in order to achieve this uh, having the bow wave crest coincide exactly with the stern wave trough. And that means that last hollow will typically occur before 0.4. Uh, so 0.4 in our simple model, and it's probably more like 0.37, something like this, 3.6, in reality, where the bow wave, if I put in a more realistic bow wave, it might occur somewhat after the bow. And if you look at some of the photos, particularly the ones of the... Uh, that is a destroyer, um, the Arleigh Burke ship, you'll see that it's the bow wave is, aft, is somewhat after the bow. So that's a more realistic model. In our simple model, it comes out to 0.4. We can also look at the case uh, of this last hump here, which is known as, as the prismatic hump. This is the prismatic hump. It's the last one before the big drag rise. In that case... The wave train situation for that is a little different. Um, I will try, I'm going to have to erase our situation here because there's too many waves going on. So what, in that case, I will extend the bow wave back. But in that case, we have lambda over L equals two-thirds. The wavelength is only two-thirds of the hull, and that means we have the bow wave, we have the first trough, we have a bow wave, and then we have a trough. We end in a trough here, and that is also where the stern wave begins, which I'll draw as red. The stern wave is here. So in this case, we have a wake where the bow wave and the stern wave are directly uh, coinciding. They're in phase, and therefore if we add them up, we get a wave field that is larger than either of them. We get a larger wake. So we went from no wake, theoretically, to a large wake 
just by changing speed and shifting the length of this bow wave here. We went from a Froude number of 0.4 in our simple relationship, closer to 0.37 in reality, and reduced to about, I can't remember what the exact number works out to here, but if we put in lambda over L equals two-thirds and solve for Froude number, we will get, uh, we will get the value. It works out Real, in a realistic case, closer to something like 0.30. That's that's a realistic number for here. This prismatic bump. Um, again, this is a very simple model where we're only considering transverse waves created by two points on the boat. Um, there were more complex models made which considered shoulder waves and things like that, but we've moved beyond that with the support of computer systems to be able to consider the entire uh, wave system on the boat. I think that's all I wanted to say. So that covers pretty much, as best I could, the uh, the stuff I put in the PowerPoint or the uh, PDF regarding stuff to definitely know something about. That doesn't mean other things are off limit, but these were things that I feel are important um, for the prelim next Tuesday. Uh, let me think. I got through everything I did. Okay, so I will upload this now.